Greetings. This is the first official meeting of the Appalachian Mystery Society. The purpose of this meeting is simply to see if this is something we can do. I know that scheduling is often difficult because we are busy people, but this meeting is to answer some questions um, and sort of introduce the, the world to the Appalachian Mystery Society and show that we actually exist. So I did um, an announcement video on my YouTube page, kind of just trying to get people to understand the concept of what I'm going for here. And um, then I tweeted out about it and got some replies in messages for people who wanted to join. And then I sort of um, went around to the researchers I already knew and tried to get them to join. And so now we have 10 members, and that's a decent start. But hopefully through this recording of meetings, we'll be able to get people to be better familiar with the idea and maybe more people will want to join. So I sent off a tweet asking for audience questions, and I've collected them here, and we're going to go over them, and you guys can discuss these questions and answer them. If all goes well, I know that scheduling can be hard, but if we get more people, maybe there'll be you know more people available. We'll do more videos like this or more sort of podcast-style uh, meetings, and we can maybe do like subject-based stuff instead of answering questions. We can like talk on a specific subject of research or something like that. I think that would be very cool. The yeah, I agree. The original intention of the Appalachian Mystery Society was for this to be a big in-person thing. We were all supposed to get together at a dusty old library and talk uh, Fortean phenomena and trade uh, folders and all that good stuff. That was my intention back when I had the idea. But then 2020 happened, so whoops, yeah. you know? Uh so the idea was for it to be an in-person thing, and 2020 was supposed to be the year. I was like, man, this is going to be the year. I'm going to collaborate with all these great researchers. It's going to be the, the, the bee's knees, man. We're going to go to old libraries and do in-person meetings, uh, but this is the best thing we can do, you know, digitally. Since we're all sort of uh, living the monastic lifestyle now, um, I've decided Discord and other forms like that would be the best way to communicate we've been communicating through discord and like google docs and things like that and that's been a good way of sharing documents and talking to people but yeah so this is a digital meeting but maybe one day we'll eventually be able to do a, a real life meeting somewhere the idea was for all of us to live in the same area live in the appalachian region so that we can collaborate on uh, regional folklore and regional stuff regional mysteries so i guess i'll go around and introduce everybody so I'm Mothman Historian, founder of the Appalachian Mystery Society. I research West Virginia folklore, Mothman, and all that good stuff. And I'm joined by my two fellow researchers here, uh, Justin Brown. You want to introduce yourself? Interface Death. What's up, everybody? Yeah, um, I have been pursuing the pretty much the most in-depth research I can possible when it comes to applying scientific methods and method you know methodologies and approaches to all the things that interesting the interest me in the paranormal which include ghosts psychic phenomena uh cryptozoology ufo phenomena and everything in between i mostly hone in on hauntings and um psychical research but have delved into a i i i think i've had one interview that I did with a, a U, an eyewitness to a UFO craft here in my whole town in Hillsboro. But I've been doing this for seven years. I've been trying to flex my f documentary filmmaking muscle along with that. Um, I'm, a, I'm a photographer, audio engineer, overall nerd. So um, I appreciate you uh, having me come in here and trying to contribute to what you got going on. Yep, and thanks for, for coming. And uh, then we have Newman. You want to introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm Newman. I'm, I'm based in North Carolina. Um, it's hard to sort of tell my, my story of what my interests are and my projects are, but um, I guess one way of looking at it is is uh, David Lynch was sort of sort of my gateway into this area. I've, I've long been fascinated by his, his movies. And then I think maybe I got interested in the, the psychedelic research. So I, I'm, I've been a researcher by trade for my whole 13 plus year career. And uh, psychedelics kind of served as another gateway into much stranger territory of, of uh, uh, it, it led one thing led to another. And I, I became fascinated, especially by 
close encounter alien abduction type phenomena in, in John Mack and, and some other work, um, Jacques Vallée. So, um, uh, yeah, and then, you know, eventually it led to kind of the Mothman stuff and just how, like how it's, it's, it's much more than just kind of the, the being encounter. And there's all this other Lynchian type strange stuff that happens around all these things. And, and so I've just become fascinated by the whole range of, of the strange. And, um, uh, so I have a creative project that is just beginning to get underway and um, all sorts of other things. But I, I'm really just kind of just just beginning to set out on this path. I, I've read uh, a lot of Newman's documents because he's been sharing some Google Docs <laughs> and he's a very thorough researcher. He lays it out in a lot of a very um, comprehensive way. So I really like the way uh, you do your Google Docs there. Um, I read <laughs> one about UFOs and then the other one was about uh, exactly what we talked about there, your spiritual journey. And yeah. um, I liked what you said, that you view these things more as David Lynch than Steven Spielberg. And that's a really good line. I was originally inspired by the New York Fortean Society, which is a society that John Keel set up in the 1980s. And he ran that for a few years before he ran out of money. But um, I thought it'd be really cool to do that and just sort of keep it going for as long as I possibly could. So I wanted mm. to set that up and have it be regional like he had in New York, but for it to be something that's very general. So like monsters, spirits, UFOs, everything, you know, sort of like what a Fortean is. But a lot of people, unfortunately, today don't understand the word Fortean. They hear that and they don't know what that is. So you have to kind of introduce that in a way. And so that's why it's the Mystery Society. So even people who don't know who Charles Ford is and don't know that kind of thing, if they're involved in any kind of mystery or any kind of mysterious thing, they can find a home here. So, yeah, that's the idea. And the original inspiration actually does involve Justin, because in 2018, I went to the Mothman Festival, and we had sort of a collaboration in the TNT area where we did like a paranormal investigation and a Ouija board and all that sort of stuff with um, Justin and my friends, Eric and Alex. Remember that, Justin? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was actually that moment that I was like, man, it would be cool if there was a, a network of researchers who like shared notes and pulled their research together in one place. Because I'm from West Virginia, and I focus on Mothman and the lore of West Virginia. And Justin here is from Ohio. And Eric and Alex, they were from Kentucky and Alabama. So I'm like, wow, we're all from Appalachia. If we put that all together, if we like learned everything we could about our state and then put it together, we could maybe have that. So it'd be cool if we had like a, a historian of every monster, like, you know, like a frogman historian, a uh, Kentucky goblin historian. And all that sort of thing. Um, my friend Alex did make that documentary, The White Things, about the Alabama White Things. And that's a very interesting thing. So that, that was kind of the inspiration was that. And then John Keel's New York Fortean Society. So I put that together, Appalachian Mystery Society. What I think what me, we all in this voice channel can relate to is uh, trying to figure out a better way to collaborate and push the research instead of watching it all be you know pretty much monopolized on tv and the the paranormal pulp culture scene it seems like all the people that maybe have had interests in paranormal subjects want to learn how to do it so on and so forth they've been at the forefront of trying to bring you know awareness and <laughs> quotes education to it which is bad so i hope things like this will try to help remedy that problem i want it to be like a regional um sort of grassroots movement kind of like how you have a historical society in every county like what if you mm -hmm. had a mystery society in every county what if there was something like that and they all shared notes uh, i would just love yeah. if we had that we we are so behind on that they Fortean society the original one uh, and then the new york Fortean society things like that a lot of those things they went for a while and then they kind of just fell off there was a time in america where every small town had a UFO club, right? And then, mm -hmm. but then somewhere around the 80s, I think the UFO field kind of started to die down a bit. And a lot of those groups just fell off. They threw their files in the garbage. Some of them sold their files to other groups. And, you know, there's no real structure going on there. So I would love for the, you know, the mysteries to have a more structure to them because I'm interested in all of them, like monsters, spirits, UFOs. What I see with um, spirits is um, a lot of, groups that go into haunted houses and things like that and they record that into um documentary or like content that is um video based but i like the sort of text 
written out ink and paper style of research. The monster people, they, they kind of are more like on the weekends, they'll go into the woods and look for Sasquatch. I like the, the nerdier sort of style where it's just like combing through books for Sasquatch stories and things like that. So I'm, I'm kind of looking for more of a less adventurous and more analytical style of that. If people would have taken that seriously, like way back in the 1930s when Charles Fort had his books and people who liked him had their societies based on him, if people would have taken that seriously and really archived it, you know, we would have all the all that data. I think another problem is um, like commercialization. Like people are um, using this as like podcast fodder or for like documentaries, which I like the documentaries. I watch those when they put them in books and documentaries. Some of them are good with if you quote that or if you use that, they're fine with it. But some of them, you know, they lay the copyright on it and then you can't research it because it's like someone else owns it. So that's another thing I'm trying to do here is something that's open to the people, open source. Anyone can sort of trade and mix and match and not have to worry right. about that sort of thing. Right. Because <laughs> I can I can definitely talk to that because I'm, you know, I'm friends with a few people that are in that do like ghost hunting on major networks. And when I go to ask them for raw data to, to try to help them review it, oh, I can't do that. The, review, uh, the networks own it. To me, it doesn't make any sense to come up with all this data, especially about regional folklore, and then put it behind like a paywall because then like the people can't get it. And if they do, they can't really do anything with it because it would be someone else's work. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of really be collaborative here and sort of less uh, competitive and more collaborative because that's another thing that people do. Do you want us to to kind of gather the data and kind of organize it to where we can submit it to libraries and like places online that are open source like that? Uh, I'm not, I'm not really sure what, what I've taken to doing is uh, this data sheet style where I just like mark out the witness, the date, the location, the brief summary of the story, kind of paraphrase and then mm -hmm. cite the sources and things like that. So that's the style I've taken to for like entries and stuff like that. And then sort of do short entries of every sighting you come across. And I've just been combing through a lot of books. That's what I've taken to. I like. I made a, a Mothman archive of like every Mothman sighting I could find, and to put them all in one place in a short form summary that is sort of like that. But online is the where you put it. Yeah, it's on uh, Keelian.org. Okay. So I've been trying to do more stuff like that, and I'm hoping that we could like pull it all together into a big data sheet or a big database, and then add new stuff as well. Like you know, I've been wanting to go out interviewing people, but once again. 2020 has not really allowed that. Yeah, so that's kind of the idea is to pull research and information and really put it into like society format where it's like like a research society. And so gotcha. I found Discord to be one of the, the only ways to do that right now. But I think that um, entertainment has sort of uh, taken over more than research has. And I'd like to sort of return the form to that. Although I do like entertainment, I would like to make documentary stuff more documentary and that's another idea of the society is that we could maybe two people who never knew each other could meet together and then they could write a book and you know that's a new content coming up out of the society or documentaries they could work together on that you know the arts and the entertainment is a part of it too but you know whenever i view art like this i always want it to be educational documentary of this stuff because it's more than just you know, I view it anyway as more than just spooky stories. I view it as something that could be a genuine mystery um, for reality, for our perceptions. So, yeah, I just wanted to really, that's kind of the idea is to take this sort of seriously, you know, not take ourselves seriously, but take the the content seriously, the research seriously. Mm -hmm. But okay, so we have some questions here from the audience. The first one is from Twitter and it says, what is everyone's favorite bit of Mothman lore? Or their favorite sighting. So, uh, Justin, you can go first. Favorite bit of Mothman lore. I think what intrigues me the most is how it's connected to other 40 and things. It's not just some huge seven foot owl like bird like creature with red glowing eyes. It, it incorporates um, men in black and UFOs and alien beings and almost everything else in between, it seems like there's this paranormal uh, glob, I should say, 
of phenomena that can occur. I mean, it, it, it's it's when you're trying to diversify these things, you kind of get lost. Um, you can't see the forest for the trees type of deal. So there seems to be a connection between all of these things, you know, cryptids, ghosts, UFOs, so on and so forth. So I think the interesting thing about the Mothman lore is how it points to those connections between all the different types of paranormal subjects. That has to be the most intriguing thing I can think about. It is this 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 whole atmosphere of, of just surrounding um, exceedingly complex and bottomlessly mysterious and highly strange things beyond just the, the sightings of the beings. It, it's um, you just put a great great list in the chat here of of all the different things. So so just to highlight a couple, I think uh, the Men in Black sightings are, are so fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. And I think this like Indrid Cold that's related to the Mothman thing, right? At least vaguely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, vaguely. Okay. So that that to me is so fascinating. Even just like the the image of his kind of grotesquely smiling face is just like a something that has has stuck with me. And, and then the idea of this Keel having this kind of phantom secretary, this bizarre person who's who's do, doing research and no one knows knows who this mysterious blonde lady is. Like like just just all these things that surround the case. Yeah. To me, is where I find most of the you know, the richness in it. A lot of that goes down to um, John Keel and his sort of unified theory that he had. I think, um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's kind of like the the idea of high strangeness is um, something that comes from J. Allen Hynek. He was describing when there are um, sightings that are dreamlike. They're almost like you know not something that could ever be in reality, but these people are very seriously saying that they saw them. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it's it's you. You have to look at consciousness, conscious perception, um, maybe even study altered states of consciousness, and maybe why people are having these altered states. It could be geological. It could be you know there could be other you know factors that play that play in there. But it seems like there is you know clues pointing to the areas. Maybe it's geomag you know anomalous geomagnetics. Maybe it's something else. Um, who knows? But I think that's where the research really needs to go because science has yet to uh, understand consciousness, and I think that lies the key in understanding why we're perceiving it in the way you you describe. A thing about the UFO connection to Mothman is there was like a wave of UFO sightings in the area at the same time that the Mothman sightings were going on in November of '66 through December '67, but. I, th- I find it interesting that there was a previous wave, like in Michigan, there was the Michigan swamp gas thing where J. Allen Hynek famously said that some of them were swamp gas and that became like a big media spectacle. That wave was then preceded by a wave in Ohio. And the wave in Ohio had the, um, like a police chase where the police were chasing down this UFO in the sky. And then we have the wave in West Virginia in Point Pleasant. And Point Pleasant is, of course, right on the Ohio River, it's on the border of Ohio. So it's almost like the UFOs went like right across the map from Michigan to Ohio to West Virginia, right in time for the Mothman wave. Now, you could say that the ley line that stretches from that area all the way through Ohio diagonally to Michigan, interesting coll- um, correlation to me when I was doing research on it. Yeah, that, that would go also to, you mentioned uh, geography. Uh, that would go to John Heal's idea that there are certain areas with some kind of electromagnetic uh, environment that is more suited for these kinds of experiences. So these experiences prop up there. Mm-hmm. The original question was um, uh, your favorite Mothman story or sighting. Is there a specific sighting? You know, we, you mentioned a bit of lore. Is there a specific sighting that pops out to you? I, I want to say the the one where it chased, I think it was the four. I'm not like an expert on it, but I think that there was a carload of four individuals who all their stories were collaborated when they were separated by law enforcement. And it's um, on display at the museum, all their handwritten accounts of that sighting and that experience. And I thought the police did a pretty decent job at taking care of that so they can see if there was any discrepancies in their stories. And uh, their stories... <laughs> They all saw the same thing. They all experienced the same thing. There's no reason for to me to find that they would lie about that. And that's got to be the most intriguing one, because not only is it such an incredible story, it's collaborated by four. 
So that to me, that's better than one, two and even three. Right. So that's got to be that's got to be it for me. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll go ahead and answer now because that's the same answer. That is the uh, Scarberry and Mallet sighting. It was Linda Scarberry, Roger Scarberry, Steve Mallet, and Mary Mallet. And that right. was on Tuesday, November 15th, 1966. That was the original sighting that started it all. That was the first uh, published and reported one. And it was by the abandoned North Power Plant in TNT area, Mason County, West Virginia. Their car was chased along Route 62 into Point Pleasant. And the creature veered off when they entered town. An interesting idea they posed was that maybe the lights of town scared it off. Which, you know, kind of goes against the whole idea that um, people make the, the joke Mothman be attracted to lights. They were sort of saying that this creature was afraid of the lights because it only followed behind their car and didn't go in front of the headlights and then disappeared in town. And a lot of the sightings were at nighttime. And Linda Scarberry believed that it would only be seen at nighttime, and she was kind of puzzled when there were sightings in the daytime. But yeah, that original sighting was the first one published. It was published by Mary Heyer and the Point Pleasant Register. It was sent off in telegraphs. It was even sent off in the Stars and Stripes newspaper to the American troops in Vietnam. So it definitely became an international story. And that's the one that's featured on the Mothman statue. If you read the Mothman statue inscription, that's the, the story they're talking about there is the Scarberry Mount sighting. Um, stories that took place before then did pop up afterwards, like prior sightings and stuff. On November 12th, there was the Kenneth Duncan sighting where it's a graveyard. November 1st, there was um, a National Guardsman who saw a brown winged creature in a tree. So there, is, there were previous sightings going all the way to the beginning of November 66. But that's the, the 15th one was the first one published. And I do think it's the probably the best one because they had no reason to say anything like this you could say sayings that came later like they were in the mothman wave they knew what to be looking for right but with scarberry and mallets they had no reason to bring up that idea you know what i'm saying yeah it, it <laughs> there there i can't sniff out anything i mean i think it's well documented well it, it yeah. was well investigated well everything they did everything pretty well as far as a research standpoint we can go back you know 50 60 years later and still do really good homework and research on it and not really smell any BS. It was, yeah, the police reports and it being four of them and really everything they described, you know, is what we think of as Mothman. There were other sightings later, which, you know, have similar descriptions or different descriptions. But what we think of as Mothman, you know, six to seven feet tall, 10 foot wingspan, uh, being able to fly hundred miles an hour, like all the descriptions we go to with Mothman, the red eyes are all there in the sighting. So I think that even if the Scarberry Mount sighting was the only sighting and no one ever saw it again, that it would still, you would pretty much still have the Mothman intact. And plus the fact that it was November 15th and 13 months later would be the December 15th, the bridge collapse, you would still have that element. So I think the core of the Mothman legend is that single sighting. You know what I mean? The other sightings are great too. I love them. But Scarberry Mounts is the, the special one in my mind. Yeah, you can always expect to, for that to, to plant seeds and other people's minds a lot of people will go out and try to find you know that experience which is another whole thing but yeah i agree yeah okay newman can you give your uh, favorite sighting if it's not the same one yeah so so i, I feel like you guys kind of took my answers because uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah every, largely everyone's gotta go with that one so yeah i guess if i were to pick a particular sighting it might be the the indrid cult thing just just the I guess him standing by the car on just a basic highway. I think it was in Ohio, right? Uh, that that, that was in uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia. Oh, that was in West Virginia. Okay. Maybe yeah. it was the the guy who had the sighting. Wasn't he from Ohio or driving back from Ohio? I, he um, yeah, that, he was driving home from Marietta, Ohio to uh, Mineral Wells, West Virginia. And the sighting occurred on intersection of Interstate 77 and Route 47, Parkersburg, West Virginia. There you go. They call you the Mothman historian for a reason. That's great. Yeah. Good old Woodrow Derenberger. Yes, yes. So, so I'll say kind of as a tangential thing, and, and I would love to know if you guys have heard anything about this, but, but when you mentioned the, the electromagnetic part of this, it made me immediately think of what, what has been so fascinating to me about these big uh, mis, uh, mis, mysterious or, or I would even say mystical type encounters, which is, is the after effects, the profound after effects. So I mentioned earlier, like the psychedelics, and, and that was really what, what brought me into that research is that Unlike anything else in social science research, 
these single experiences can so profoundly change someone's life. And then you have these encounters with, with these mystical beings, be that with aliens or Mothman or, or anything else, they have the, a, a, an eerily similar type of effect as do near-death experiences. And not just like they're a moving experience, but there are all these other profound changes in terms of physiological changes, physical changes, energetic changes, and then even getting down to the kind of electromagnetic type changes where, where people often report that light bulbs will, will, will more often kind of uh, break in their presence or, or electronic devices more often malfunction in their presence. So it just there just seems to be something deeply uh, transformative about having these encounters. And, and I'm curious if, if you all have heard of any of any such after effects with the Mothman case. Um, yeah, one of the big ones was uh, eye burn, something that people can get from exposure to ultraviolet lights. And so like if you were to be welding without a welding mask, you would get that sort of thing. Witnesses would say they had that after a UFO encounter. And Connie Carpenter, one of the Mothman witnesses, she had eye burn after seeing the Mothman, uh, the glowing red eyes. And so Keel thought perhaps the, the eyes themselves had some sort of um, electromagnetic frequency to them or that they had ultraviolet rays in them that would um, have that effect on people. I like that you mentioned sociological effects because I think a lot of people take this stuff in a very literal way, like they, they want them to be literal uh, beings from outer space or something like that. But I think that even if someone just feels they've had that experience or something happened to them, to them that they're convinced that this happened, you know, even that is important, I think, in a sociological way. So even if they just think they saw something and they didn't actually see it, um, I think that's still important. It can have an effect on them mentally. I think that still deserves to be studied, you know, even if they're not literal creatures. Yeah, the, the quote that I come back to all the time from, from Kenneth Ring, who's, who was an academic who studied the after effects, he says, whatever their ontological status, meaning regardless of whether these are, are real externally existing beings or not, these experiences are real in their effects. And, and that, I think, is, is kind of undeniable. And, and, and their effects are, I think, also um, more profound and transformative than almost anything else that will happen in one's life. This is like the transformation that occurs after these experiences is far bigger than the birth of a child or the death of a loved one or almost anything else that you can name. Like these are so profoundly transformative that even if there's nothing real behind them, they deserve serious study. That's kind of where I come from with all this. It becomes a character and an archetype, even if it's uh, based on like a misconception. Like Mothman is now a character that, you know, has a museum and a festival and brings people together. It affects culture, and all of that comes from one person's or four people's experience that night on uh, November 15th. So I think that, you know, has an undeniable effect on sociology and, you know, the individual people's psychology. And something that gets overlooked sometimes is that a lot of these witnesses didn't have just one sighting. Linda Scarberry, who's like the star witness, uh, she's the one that talked about it most. She had, um, experiences afterwards like she had a sighting on her roof when she lived with her her mother like they had like a slanted roof and the mothman was seen crouching outside her window and also a lot of these witnesses they didn't live in haunted houses until they had a sighting and suddenly they have poltergeist experiences going on in their house they would smell uh cigar smoke they would hear odd beeping noises and heartbeats and they would start having strange dreams and um they'd hear the sound of a sped up phonograph record which is a, an odd thing to hear. And so they had, they were almost haunted by the Mothman in a way, or haunted by their experience. And some of them wouldn't talk about it. Like after a while, they didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to bring it up because they felt that if they talked about it, it would come back. And Marcella Bennett, um, she had experiences where she'd be driving and she'd feel like Mothman was in the back seat. And so she hit the brakes and turned to look behind her. Um, you know, it, it affected a lot of people. Some people went, um, for like shock to the the hospital and didn't want to didn't want to say what they had seen and so everyone had their own unique reaction i think the reaction that people have is one of the most interesting things like the scarberry mallets when they got back from their sighting the the first thing they did was um they debated about what they should do should they call the police should they go into town and tell people eventually they went to tiny's diner and told the people there and they called the cops but one other thing they did before they decided to call the cops, because they didn't want to get laughed at, they didn't want to be, you know, they didn't want to get police involved. The first thing they did was go back down the road. They said, we're going to double check. So they drove back down the road 
and they saw something fly over their car. They also saw a dead dog in the road. And uh, that's when they turned back and said, okay, we got to, this is still down there. And the, of course, when the police arrived, they couldn't find anything. But the reaction that gets me most is that they all went to the Scarberry's house. They all stayed together, turned the lights on, and stayed up the whole night. Like, they, they weren't going to sleep after that. And I heard Linda Scarberry, they said that she slept with the lights on after her experience for many years afterwards. So that's sort of the wow. effect this thing can have. Something I find so curious too is is um, with Kenneth Ring's research that where you have the the near death experience, which which in general is so kind of blissful and, and loving and, and kind of you know what what you would imagine a mystical experience to be like, but then you have in contrast the the, the close encounter, which is I think more like the Mothman experiences, where they they're awfully deeply terrifying and traumatic and difficult and and, and bizarre, uh, and yet those two contrasting feeling tones lead to almost identical after effects in terms of changes in values, changes in physical things. It, it, that, that's something that I've really had to grapple with. And it was like the big mystery that has, has set me down this path of being fascinated in these topics. Well, one thing I'll add real quick, if I may, it, it really depends on the age in which these people are having these experiences too, and how established their idea of reality is the younger you are, the the more reality can kind of morph into one thing or the other. Or you, there's really no structure to what you really believe, what's real, what's not. So you don't um, establish fears to a lot of different things about mortality, supernatural beings, life after death, so on and so forth. So when you're an adult and you experience something that breaks everything you think or that you believe is real, that is the that's the profound effect that you're looking at. It's going to change the actual neurology in your brain instantaneously, and that can have <laughs> really crazy. It, it impacts you in crazy ways, and it's what what needs to be studied. As um, Newman and we are all, you know, definitely wanting to take a look at is what what is it changing? How are people handling and coping with it? What are the neurological changes, the sociological changes, so and so forth? Because, yeah, I, I think that's uh, you're on to something there, but it really needs to be understood on a physiological and psychological level. One point I want to make about religiosity is a lot of these witnesses viewed this through a religious framework. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if someone sees a light in the sky, some people would say, oh, it's a, a UFO, or they'll say it's, a, it's an alien or something like that. But it easily could be something else, like a, an angel or some sort of spirit. Right. So it depends on your frame of reference and like how you were raised and what kind of things you were right. told to believe. But it's amazing that you can have just a simple light in the sky, not, not anything attached to it, nothing like that, just a simple light in the sky. And suddenly your mind is open to what is possible in reality, like what could mm -hmm. exist. Like there could be another world out there and they could be sending technological, you know, advanced ships or this could be um, some sort of spirit and therefore spirits are real. And so it does expand the mind in a way. It's, um, you know, enlightening or illuminating and it's a, a form of gnosis. That can definitely alter the mind and change the mind. And it changes communities as well. I mean... If you look at miracles and miraculous events like Marian apparitions and things like that, that, that changes the place where it was seen. That becomes like a pilgrimage site, and that community is not the same as it was before that happened. Um, Point Pleasant is not the same as it was before the Mothman happened. Um, you know, I read a book from someone who lives in Point Pleasant, and they said after the Mothman, uh, normal was gone. You know, they hoped for things mm -hmm. to be normal, and normalcy was just gone. And that's kind of what a lot of these witnesses go through as well, is they can't just well, some of them do. Some of them just forget what, they ha what happened. They put it away. There are many Mothman witnesses who won't talk about it. For example, Roger Scarberry and the Mallets, they, they will not talk about it to this day. Um, Linda Scarberry was the most vocal one. But mm -hmm. some people, when they have an uh, experience and it goes beyond what they conceive to, to be reality, they'll just throw it away. They'll say, that didn't happen. Yep. Other right. people, you know, now their minds are more open and they have to they're they're doomed to forever repeat this story to everyone they know. They have to do um, interview upon interview upon interview and retell the same experience. Well, I was going to say, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be interesting to see in a lot of these cases that the like something like DMT is released into the body from the pineal gland in certain in some of these sightings and how that changes you? Uh, that makes me think of the God Helmet, where they they put the the electrodes on on the head and mm -hmm. they sort of trigger something with electromagnetic response that makes them have a religious uh, epiphany. 
that would I think be... that's the I think that's the DMT release. Yeah, that that would be the closest thing I would think of of that. I heard someone come up with an interesting kind of naturalistic explanation to explain um, kind of close encounters and their after effects. And it went something it, it involved. It was actually the same guy who invented the the God helmet. I forget that guy's name, but but he and someone else came up with this theory. And it involved maybe there's some electromagnetic release, especially around tectonic plates, and that that interacts with the temporal lobe. And then people just have these bizarre, wild encounters. And so in a way, it feels like it's it's one of the best theories I've heard because it does try to actually account for the data in terms of what actually happens to these people mm-hmm. um, and why some people are, are kind of more prone to these experiences than others. But and yet they, the, the people who came up with this theory had to admit that this still falls short of trying to explain away all of you know what, what's happening. Like, like there's still something deeply bizarre and, and puzzling to our, our kind of ordinary worldview that just this doesn't fit in neatly into it. Yeah. There might it might be so complex that it's an emergent phenomena, you know, a complex emergent phenomena that may never be understood. The idea behind the God helmet would be that it does artificially what the environment could potentially be doing naturally. So in these certain areas that John Keel would call like a window area that have this sort of magnetic environment for whatever reason, it somehow interfaces with the mind and creates that experience. And then the idea of the God helmet would be doing that same thing but you know on command as opposed to by chance well i i I investigate i investigate quite a bit as you know and uh the last uh, major investigation i was on this year um i keep hearing magnetic field interference on my microphones right before strange things happen like battery drains um psychical effects uh evp all kinds of things so there has to be there has to be something that involves um, the motion of electrons and the electromotive effect, the EM, you know, st- phenomena that we're experiencing. It's definitely involved and yeah. it's an indicator. Because the, the entire paranormal like ghost hunting field right now currently is based on that groundwork. They're walking around with EMF detectors. And so the idea is that that would have to be involved. And I think a lot of the UFO community also accepts that as that has to be involved. Because, mm-hmm. you know, that's what they actually had UFO detectors, which were like, like EMF meters, there was like a needle that would move. And they would say that means there there's UFO activity. So the same concept shows up in different fields. One more thing I was going to say about religiosity is that Linda Scarberry, after her sightings, and we're talking about the reaction people have, her first reaction was that she wanted some kind of spiritual guidance. She wanted some kind of counseling. So she tried to go to the church. Um, But in her area, the churches, they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't take it seriously. They wouldn't accept that this could have happened. And so they laughed her off and said that what she saw was the devil that they had chased out of their church. They they really Jesus Christ. Yeah. So they didn't accept that. And then eventually, you know, when John Heal came to town, he kind of had to guide them because he had so much experience researching mysteries because they were struggling with, you know, understanding this and sort of like an existential crisis they were having. You know, John Keel is someone who doesn't like authority. He doesn't like being authority. He had a business card that said, John Keel, not an authority on anything. He has to give people this, what he calls bad advice, because he has nothing else to do for these people who are struggling with understanding this stuff. Um, One thing he did that was controversial, actually, is he told uh, Linda Scarberry to hang up a golden cross in her room to bring her some sort of comfort in a, um, you know, like a uh, placebo effect kind of way. And a strange thing that happened later is, she had like a sort of phantom experience um, when she had her daughter in a crib and a man in a suit, a checkered suit, walked in and was smoking a cigarette. Uh, apparently a light from the cross shined down and he disappeared entirely. So there was a sort of phantom experience that happened, um, you know, that that protected against. So, yeah, these witnesses, like I said, they, they didn't just see the Mothman. Uh, you said before people are prone to seeing things. And I found that to be true that people who have had one experience, they've probably had other experiences. If they've seen a a UFO or a light in the sky, they might have seen a Sasquatch in the woods, you know, the same sort of thing. Or they might have owned a haunted item or uh, lived in a haunted place. So I do see clusters of that sort of thing, especially in areas. We talked about uh, geographic areas, but it it seems like it's not just the area, it's also the people. So it's like certain people, certain places, and certain times. That's the formula I've kind of worked out. It's got to be the the right person in the right place in the right time, or if you prefer the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
Mm -hmm. It is an emergent phenomena. That's what makes it so hard to study. Because the Scarberry Mallets, they kept going back to the TNT area, but nothing ever happened again. So they're the right people. That's the right place. But it's not the right time. And people constantly go on the TNT area. I've been there, you know, countless times. I've never really seen anything uh, completely unexplainable. So, you know, it depends on the person and the time and the place. I don't know if this goes into psychedelic experiences and other things like near-death experiences and things like that. But I found that, you know, it's very common for after the, the witness to have this experience, for them to reject the experience and say, no, that didn't happen, or try to rationalize it or explain it away. Um, and I find that interesting because I had an experience, or I guess every time I ever have any kind of experience that might be potentially paranormal, I always immediately jump to trying to explain away. Um, I had an experience where the knob on my door, you know, we've all been locked in for a while. So uh, during 2020, mid, mid in the year 2020, um, the knob on my door was turning one night and it like I woke up to the, the doorknob turning and the, the the door being pushed on and there was no one there. So I've been trying to explain that away like immediately as it happened. I'm like, that didn't just happen. <laughs> And also another I, I've seen the same thing. Yeah, so that's like what you call poltergeist activity because it's like, you know, it was it made the noise, it moved. So another one is that the TNT area, this is one of the the few uh strange experiences I've had there is the three knocks. I heard three knocks on the an igloo bunker, you know, went in there, looked around with a flashlight, there was nothing there. I was standing outside and it it was a strange thing because I've gone there a hundred times like, you know, hoping to see something. But this one time, I was with my parents, and I wanted to show them the place, and, you know, it was kind of formulaic. It was kind of like, oh, I'll just show them around real quick. I wasn't looking to see something. And going in with that state of mind, apparently that's what, you know, if that was a paranormal experience, that's what done it. So I walked in, and I was holding uh, my EMF meter, and my mother said that it lit up when the thing, when I heard the three knocks. I jumped back, the EMF meter lit up, and then I grabbed my flashlight, went in there looked around of everything, and I couldn't explain it. The only uh, way I could explain it is maybe there was, because the TNT area bunker has a hole at the top. I thought maybe rocks, like three rocks, just fell down or something. But we didn't do anything for that to happen. But that, that's another experience I've had that I try to explain away. So you guys have any thoughts on, on that? Well, the first thing I will say is, my what <laughs> I hope someone quotes me one day, um, you don't find the paranormal, the paranormal finds you. So always remember that for everyone listening and everybody on this call. That is probably the most true statement I have come come up with over the last life, last forty years, forty one years of my life. So, but the, with co with coping, is it, it, it can it can be rather complex. It could just be straightforward at times. But when you're trying to rationalize, um, when you're truly trying to rationalize, it's it's mostly due to the fact that. Um, it things just don't compute. I remember the first time this happened. Um, me and my then girlfriend, now wife, was sitting on a love seat in a house that I um that I lived in that had a lot of stuff happen. And it, um, we were sitting there watching a movie, and it was quite some time ago because it was a we were watching a VHS tape. So there was a penny laying on top of the VHS player, and I remember watching the TV, and then I. For some reason, my attention was drawn to the penny. Right as I looked at it, it lifted up off of the VHS player, rotated 360 degrees, and carefully laid back down right in front of my eyes. And I immediately turned over to my uh, to Christy, my wife. She's, I was like, you saw that, right? And she's like, yeah, I saw that. So immediately, I'm trying to rationalize. Like, it just it broke my brain. and. I'm like, well, Christy saw it too, so I can't be hallucinating it. So what's the explanation? So I'm like, oh, there's there's magnets in the VHS player. I go over there and I try to replicate it. I try to, you know, go over there to see if I can find anything magnetized. There's nothing. But see, l little did I know that I will I would see pennies just mysteriously fly through the air periodically in the same house. But I think sometimes we're afraid and we're terrified and we try to convince ourselves that it's not real. Because of fear, I think because of what you said before, you know, we would have to uh, maybe if we can't talk about it, that's going to cause some stress. So when we do come to the point where we have to talk about it with somebody, then people are going to judge us. 
So all of those reasons are good enough reasons to try to disbelieve what what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does kind of parallel certain people have had trauma and stuff like parallels that in a way they don't want to talk about it afterwards. But um, yeah, one thing I want to say, though, is, you know, if you have an experience, you should be skeptical. You should immediately try to rationalize it and explain it. But there comes a point where it's like if you can't explain it, you have to then accept that it's unexplainable or that it's mysterious. You can't just, you know, you, like you have to use rationale. But when there comes a point where rationale fails, you have to accept, OK, that was some kind of spiritual or mystical occurrence. You know what I mean? That's kind of how I view that. Exactly. Yeah, it, you, you have to make sure that you have to be careful to identify your own bias. You have to be careful to identify um, putting your own thoughts and beliefs into the equation. So if you can step outside of that and try um, to be careful, you know, to exclude what your bias is, like if, if you don't believe in ghosts and you see a ghost, you shouldn't allow your bias that there's no ghost to, to be a problem when trying to figure that out is, would be an example. So I definitely think you have to have skepticism, but then don't just, you know, be blinded or, you know, close minded, you know, like that, where you don't see when something actually mysterious happens. Like in high school, I was very skeptical, atheist kind. But now I've gotten a lot more spiritual. I still try to be skeptical like the Fordians are. But yeah, in high school, I probably never would have thought that I would, you know, ever entertain that. So I, I definitely have like some sometimes I'm a bit over skeptical. So I definitely have that kind of mindset. You mentioned not having biases, but I think that when you have a mystical experience or a paranormal experience or what have you, I think your subconscious does play into it. You know what I mean? Like, I think that what's in your subconscious sort of comes out during those experiences. I don't know if you would agree with that idea. Well, when it, when it, emerges, when it emerges and happens, yes. But when you're taking a look at it afterward is what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I, I think that there is some uh, subconscious at, at work there when people have experiences. Because I, like I said, I'm not very much of a literalist. I don't really, I don't think it's biologically possible for there to be a six to seven foot tall man that can fly around. So I definitely do think that something, it's like um, a manifestation and it's related to psychology. I, I do believe that when we are kind of trying to practice discernment with these these very hairy subjects, um, it is really important that we, we you know, there, there have to be some things that we dismiss as just not true, as, as hoaxes or hallucinations or misidentifications or, or implanted memories or, you know, whatever these prosaic expl explanations are, those exist and those actually do explain a lot of the, the happenings. Like we can't, we can't hide from that and we can't pretend that isn't true. Uh, and yet there's something really interesting about how even those of us who are interested in these subjects, when we have these encounters ourselves, we are kind of strangely quick to kind of explain them away in, in a way that, that feels like there's, there's something subconscious happening there that is, is, is weird. It, it, maybe it relates in some ways to, you know, like with the close encounter thing, there's always this, this, this idea of missing time where, where people like don't even remember a large section of what just happened to them, like two hours go by or something. And I think there's even something like after a, a near death experience, it, it's, it can be sort of like a dream where if, if they aren't really paying attention to it, they can very quickly lose the, at least the conscious memory of having had that experience. So, so there is something there where it's, it, it's like, it's it, whatever these experiences are they usually occur in what seems to be an altered state of consciousness and so it's not totally um smooth to, to carry that back forward into kind of ordinary waking consciousness that the memory isn't quite right right there but but something that's maybe related but but i find equally fascinating is um there's a, a fairly new podcast called aliens and artists by, by this this guy named Stuart davis and one of the things i find most fascinating about his story is um, so he has, he has a number of experiences with his, uh, with his wife there and several other, uh, eyewitnesses who are, you know, seeing a UFO through a telescope or just, or other kind of strange noises and, and just cases of high strangeness happening around him. And so his wife is there right next to him, observing the same things he is, validating and confirming what he's seeing. And yet her perspective is so very different. And this is what, so like Stuart Davis, you know, he got so into these subjects that he just started a podcast and this is, you know, occupying so much of his mental and emotional energy. Whereas his wife, her response is, I'm going to bed, right? Like, I, I don't know what that is. I, I can't, I can't make room for that 
in, in my my life and so i'm just i'm just going to bed right so it's it's like there's something that i really kind of envy about that is the ability to just sort of take these super strange worldview exploding encounters and then just go to bed right like that's yeah. um i just feel like there's something really interesting and important there of like how is it that that people approach these things in such different ways yeah, it could it could be the differences in uh left brain and right brain functions there'll, there'll be people who spend their whole lives like in the woods waiting for sasquatch and then there'll be someone who's just trying to go about their day who sees it run out in front of the road so i think there are certain people who it's attracted to there are certain people who are interested in it or meant to be interested in it and certain people who are just meant to go about their lives and not worry about it but about the skeptical mindset you're, you're seeking out to the paranormal but then when it actually happens you're like no that didn't happen so it's this i'm definitely of two minds there where i'm a researcher and i'm trying to be skeptical but i'm interested in spirituality and i'm i'd like to have some kind of encounter so that's a an interesting sort of uh, contradiction that I think a lot of researchers have. It definitely sounds like you're conflicted. Yeah. There are certain people who uh, talk ill on like debunkers and stuff like that, but I think they serve their purpose in the, in the field. Like you have to have people who are always out there trying everything they can to disprove. You know, some of them are just dismissing baselessly, but some of them, you know, are doing good work. And uh, I think that's because I believe the real experiences can stand up to scrutiny. So I say bring on like all the debunkers, you know what I mean? And like, let's see if we can, you know, get rid of the stuff that can be debunked. And I think hoaxes and things like that definitely should be debunked. I think if something can be proven to be a hoax, it probably should be. Would you two agree with that concept? Yeah, well, I I will say um, in antiquity, I know at least in antiquity, True statements spoken from men can have you stoned, burned at the stake, exiled, <laughs> you yeah. know? So so I, I really like what you said there, but we're, we're viewing all these things through the lens of how rigorous we want to be scientifically and objective. We never can be 100% objective, which I think is the major problem. I do think the field is subjective, like it's more... Uh psychological based i think that if any science has the the means to tackle this it would be psychology or like parapsychology or sociology or parasociology a study of the mind i think is what you'd have to study if you wanted to study the paranormal like persecution and like people who are dismissing mm-hmm. obviously that you know goes too far but like i think skepticism and you know attempts at debunking are something that has its place there uh and then certain things are kind of like unfalsifiable can't be proven one way or another mm-hmm. If we can get to the point where we can come up with a model that adheres to some type of principle of science, whether it be math, whether it be, you know, whatever, we need to be able to predict something um, and have it happen and replicate it. You know, so if there is a UFO sighting, we have to understand um, how we're able to um, identify what it is. Um, if we can identify it as something that's not man-made, as something that's not um, being maneuvered or flown by anyone of this earth, I mean, we, we'll have to be able to come up with an extraordinary thing to to make that real. So that's what the problem is with like UFOs and ghost sightings and things. It's just something that we're observing and we don't understand it. So we need to find out how we're able to make these things not, you know, either falsifiable or true. It's just we're not close enough to the phenomena in order to make it objection, objectively true. The the idea of being able to repeat something is exactly what science is looking for. And you can't really do that when we're talking about sporadic sightings that happen all across the world. Right. You know what I mean? But right. we talked before about the idea of a, a cloud chamber or a UFO test tube. I found a, an interesting article that had that where people were using electromagnetism to create these little um, orbs in test tubes that would float around. And the idea is that that could be potentially what shows up on radar or what people see in the sky. And so, you know, if you could just, if if you could create a UFO in a lab, you know, that would be really something. But, you know, I kind of look at the paranormal as maybe we're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Like you really can't fit it in a science, but, you know, maybe people have been, 
talking since the 70s about electromagnetism and quantum physics. So maybe that does connect in some way to what's going on here. I hope so. I do feel that the phenomena is like playing around like a bit of a trickster. It's, you know, meant to kind of be beyond understanding. Like, I don't think it's something that wants to be understood. I think it's kind of like um, purposefully hidden for it to continue to exist. It has to remain hidden. And it does so purposefully, like, you know, when cameras go out right before something happens, I do think Mm -hmm. there's like a shrouding factor, like something that is saying like, no, you can't go this far. You can't understand this yet. You know, if you look at our study, maybe we're going step by step, you know, maybe each generation will learn a little bit more. And eventually there will be, you know, a time and a place where it's finally revealed where all the monsters come out of the woods to say hello and all the UFOs appear in the sky and, you know, everything just comes out to say here we are, you know, but I don't think we're close to that right now. Boy, that would be, that would be one hell of an episode of Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What I was going to say about religiosity, I keep going back to this, is um, there were sightings in Point Pleasant where someone saw a white, hairy creature, like long hair, had wings, and it's kind of counted among the Mothman sightings, but the details are very bizarre, and it was seen by a mother and her daughter they reported that they thought it was Jesus, like because they they live in a very religious area. And that's how they put it in the framework. They saw a winged creature with long hair. And they're like, this must be an apparition uh, of Jesus. So I find that sort of thing fascinating is some of these things, if they weren't dismissed by the church or something, they could have been that. Like the Mothman uh, as a folklore character and a newspaper character could have been viewed as miraculous or could have been the Point Pleasant Angel, if it would have been accepted in that way. Can I can I have someone illustrate a meme with Mothman with Jesus' head on it now? I don't know. Please, please I, I, I want to do that. That would that would be entertaining to me. <laughs> yeah, and but then there's the opposite end where people want to view it more as uh, you know demonic or something like that. Um, sure. People look at the Men in Black that way too, as well. I, I look at the Men in Black sort of like Grim Reaper type characters. Um, if you think about the men in black, they're they're wearing black suits and they're uh, a lot of them are pale and it kind of resembles like death. Like if someone is being buried, they're going to be wearing a, a black suit. So I, I kind of look at them as like a modern interpretation of the Grim Reaper. They often show up, you know, they're threatening or they bring with them bad news and that sort of thing in a omen type way. So I, I think they might be connected to the Grim Reaper mythology. Because the Grim Reaper would appear on a black horse and would be wearing burial wrappings. And the modern form of burial wrappings would be a black suit. So that's a little uh, theory I came up with. Oh, the the whole men in black thing is crazy, dude. Especially, it's scary. And I think the whole, the whole idea behind them is fear-based. I don't yeah. know if it's paranoia playing a fact, factor or if it's some type of supernatural force... Um, taking advantage of people's paranoia and fear and using that as a weapon in that, in that case. It's very fascinating. Yeah, I definitely do look at the men in black as sort of the personification of uh, negative authority. They're kind of mm-hmm. the personification of censorship, if you think about it. They're coming to tell you, like, don't talk about your sighting, don't do this, don't do that. It could be like, we talked about before how people have that reaction where they want to explain things away. It could be a part of their uh, psychology. That'd be, cra- that'd be crazy, where dude. It's, you know, <laughs> the part of them that doesn't want to talk about it. Maybe it's like the shadow, as Carl Jung I, talked about. That would be a psychokinetic manifestation of that. Yeah, exactly. Like th- their own paranoia visits upon them in a black suit. That's crazy. But yeah, men in black come from the UFO uh, field. They definitely do. That's uh, Albert Bender in 1953, published by Gray Barker in 1956 in They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers. Barker is not the most trustworthy of people, but Bender is, I don't know, he's sort of one of the early UFO researchers. So it's really, if there is any truth to The Men in Black, it comes from Albert Bender. But I think there doesn't necessarily have to be any truth to it in order for people to see that, in order for people to have those experiences. Yep. So yeah, I think, you know, Al Bender and Gray Barker kind of put together the perfect UFO boogeyman when they released that book. But yeah, that was, um, Al Bender had uh, the International Flying Saucer Bureau, and that was in the early 50s when flying saucers were first a big thing. A lot of the sci-fi people and people who were into speculative science 
They set up a bunch of UFO clubs around that time. A lot of them were into the Schaefer mystery, things like that. And Al Bender was one of the first people to do that. He collaborated with Gray Barker, and he joined the group. And then uh, he puts out a newsletter one day. And these flying saucer fanzines, there's so much lore in them. Like, it seems the foundations of UFO lore are built into these UFO fanzines that were Xeroxed on tissue paper and sent across to, like, 20 people across the country. These fanzines, like, were big important. I think in some cases they're more, the fanzines are more important than the actual books that people wrote. He put out an issue of his newsletter, Space Review. He announced that the, his International Flying Saucer Bureau was going to close down. And he said he'd been given orders by higher powers, and he didn't specify what that was. So Barker went to investigate, and Bender told him the story. And, you know, it's, he was visited by three shadowy men. They had glowing red eyes. They wore black suits and things like that. And that became a big buzz in the UFO field because of, you know, that saucer bureau being shut down. And from there, it kind of just infected the, the rest of the, the whole saucer field with paranoia about these shadowy figures who don't want you to talk. And yeah, I, some, didn't know, I didn't know that. Some of them viewed, viewed it as government interference, and some of them viewed it as aliens. And John Keel, who takes a lot of spiritual views, he viewed it more as like, these are part of the phenomena. These are a manifestation in some way. They're ultra-terrestrials, he called them. Um, mm -hmm. Albert Bender, it's often mentioned, Albert Bender was in, into the occult as well. Uh, you know, he had like an altar with some sort of basic black magic stuff on it. And so people speculate that perhaps it was related to that. But I do think it came from the research he was doing of flying saucers. Because the whole idea behind the men in black is they knew too much. Like if you ever solve the mystery, it goes back to the, what I talked about, how it shrouds itself. It doesn't want to be known or figured out. Mm -hmm. uh, John Keel said, flying saucers are a game and the prize is a straitjacket. And then the, you know, the men in black kind of showed up in Point Pleasant around the time that John Keel showed up in Point Pleasant. And, you know, they visited Mary Heyer, who, you know, John Keel had told about all this stuff. So I do think it is kind of psychological and it could be just psychological, but there could be something to the, there could be a seed of truth in that original story. It's okay. fascinating. Oh, that's all I know. I uh, didn't talk very much about injured cold, so I wanted to say a few things on that. It's just one of the things that Kiel wrote about in his book, Mothman Prophecies. The original title was The Year of the Garuda, and so the book was about December 66 to December 67, that year of his research. So it wasn't really about just Mothman. It was about that year, and that year was the year that he spent in Point Pleasant. But it also features stuff in New York and in Long Island and all the general stuff going on in the world and some of the UFO conferences he went through, things like that. So the book is not really a Mothman book. It has Mothman in it, but it's more than that. So he mentions Intercold Cold because him and Gray Barker interviewed Woodrow Derenberger. He also came out with a book. You know, he wasn't a writer, but he got a writer to write down his story based on him relaying it. That's kind of what a lot of UFO witnesses did back in the day. And his book is called Visitors from Lanulus, and it came out in 1971, and John Keel did an introduction for it in the book. And he pretty much says that he doesn't really believe this story, but you should hear him out anyway. So I find that fascinating, that even back then he's like, I don't know if I really believe this story, but you should hear him out. So, you know, John Keel was a very skeptical person. I think it just sort of, you know, put in my mind just the, the memory of this. Yeah, the cross-armed, tall, vaguely creepy-looking, kind figure who's smiling in a creepy but friendly way. And so it, it's just, there's so many things yeah. about it that just have that kind of Lynchian feel of there's something that feels mythic and rich and interesting about it. There actually is a scene in Lost Highway by David Lynch where I think it might be inspired by Andrew Cold, the smiling man who appears in the party, very Andrew Cold. He, like, talks telepathically. So I think that is a similarity. But the thing about Andrew Cold is he's not supposed to be scary, but people tell this story over and over again, and they want it to be like a horror story. They try to make him sound scary, but um, there was nothing scary about the way he looked. He was a normal person. He smiled politely. It's just scary that he came down in a spacecraft, you know. He said, do not be frightened of us. You've ever read biblical encounters in the, of angels in the Bible? That's what they say. They say, be not afraid. Yeah, it kind of gives you a clue. Uh, like, it seems like this entity is, you know, when the person there 
to be sure that they're not there to do them harm or anything yeah. like that. And that's kind of something that um, I see ghost hunters and investigators do. They'll they'll say that to spirits to try to entice them to speak to them. They'll be like, we're not here to hurt you or to get you to leave type of thing. So yeah. it's almost like there is an act of communication, a clear act of, uh, you know, communication. They want to communicate. Uh, eventually, Derenberger adapted to that and sort of saw him as a friend. And I've read Tanya Derenberger's book. She talks about how Indra Cold showed up at Woodrow Derenberger's funeral. And I found that to be an interesting note there to add, like an afterword, is that, you know, after Derenberger faced a lot of persecution and was kind of bugged by everyone um, and retreated off away from the spotlight, he, Indra Cold, apparently was still around with his family. Tanya Derenberger describes him as this uh, nice, tanned fellow. And she says he spoke to her verbally because he didn't want to scare her. So it makes me think, was there, you know, a potential, like, actual person playing the role of Indra Cold? Someone who just has a spaceship and can communicate telepathically? Or do you guys have any takes on that? You've watched a lot of my... uh my webcast, right, Mothman? You know that my mother has really influenced my, you know, view and belief in the paranormal and the kind of the stories I got brought up on and the, you know, things that she says she's witnessed. And I'll tell you what, I mean, this sounds exactly like the crap my mom says. Okay. And what's interesting about a lot of these stories is not everyone exists in the same reality as we do like my mother does not exist in the same reality we do she shifts out of it and exists in other realities and you know she is rooted in this one but she does not always stay here so she's constantly um having these experiences that just sound like fairy tales and you know, stuff that, you know, some sci-fi writer or whatever came up with in a book. And when, and before, if you would have asked me before, you know, what do you think about this stuff? I'm like, oh, it's, it's a bunch of horse crap. But I, I just can't say that because the paranormal world is such a strange and adverse place, you know, compared to what we think reality is. It You can't, you have to, you have to, by default be so open-minded about these things, even if it sounds so far removed from what you have experienced or what you think is real and not real. Like, you know, that's, I think that's a mistake. A lot of paranormal researchers that choose to be skeptical do is they don't leave their open-mindedness open enough to allow themselves to approach something without bias immediately after hearing something like that. So yeah. you kind of have to put that story on the shelf. You can't just put it in a trash or yeah. um, put it into your thumb drive into the way you think the paranormal is either. You can't just download it as acceptable right away. So you just have to shelf it and not think one way or the other about it until you find other stories that can collaborate it. Because once the um, anecdotal stuff you know, start to stack up and stack up and stack up, then that's when you can start. Uh, just coming to con certain conclusions like my mom used to talk about these orbs of light that would come out of the sky and land in the apple orchard and her and her sister would see these childlike beings come out and they would play with them i thought when i was you know a teenager thought she was crazy and then i would go online years later and i know my mom hasn't talked to these other people and they would explain the exact same thing and i'm like okay wait how is this how are how are the two how are two people completely unrelated crazy in the exact same way? I just don't think so. So you have to keep these things on the shelf until you start are able to connect some dots. I think that's how I rationalize it because you can't think. I mean, we're talking about the paranormal here. You can't think for a second what's real, what's not real when you're talking about the paranormal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, one thing you mentioned there, we're talking now about sort of the acclimation that people have to the paranormal as opposed to the aversion that we talked about before, where people accept it as normal. Um, I've had people where I ask them, has anything strange happened? Has anything weird happened? Like, I'm looking to see if they have any sightings. And they'll say, nothing weird. 
and I'll say, well, have you ever seen like a, a light in the sky? And they'll say, oh yeah, I saw a few of those yesterday. Like to them, it's normal. So I think to certain people, they live the surreal and it sort of becomes normal to them. And Woodrow mm-hmm. Denberger definitely accepted this character straight out of a fairy tale book as real. Like, oh yeah, this is the spaceman who's going to join us for dinner tonight. I talked about Linda Scarberry. Um, at first, they were afraid of the, the Mothman. But when she had that later sighting on her roof, she said that it looked lonely and that she had sympathy for it and that it looked cold when it was out there in the, on, on the roof. And so she came to see Mothman as sort of a lonely, sympathetic creature. And so people do, after a while, sort of accept things. Like if you have a ghost in your house, you might at first be afraid uh, or annoyed by it knocking over objects. But then eventually you'll kind of see it as sort of like a living mate, someone who lives with you. Right. So that's like the acclimation of the, to the paranormal. And we talked about how it affects psychology. That definitely affects psychology. If it's affecting your daily life, there are people who definitely live that way. And who knows if it's a, an elaborate performance art, but they're definitely living that way as if it's true. You know, that's kind of what ritual is as well as you, you know, regardless if it's true or not, people are acting that out. They have a narrative in their mind and they act it out into reality. Oh, yeah. You mentioned how you shouldn't, you should take this story and see if there's other things that correspond to it, other things that connect with it. And that's something that I think is very important is to not tell other witnesses, like, don't contaminate the witness. Like if you interview somebody and you know for a fact that down the street someone saw the same exact thing. Don't tell them like that story. You know what I mean? Like kind of leave these separate and you'll be amazed at the kind of connections you'll see. You were mentioning how you went online and saw the same kinds of stories. You know, these trends, these overall trends and these clusters of the same thing from people who are no way connected. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important thing to do. I've seen a few researchers get sloppy and kind of say, oh, the guy down the street saw this. And they'll ask leading questions to try to make the two fit. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it doesn't fit. Like some people saw Mothman as light gray. Some people saw him as dark gray or brown. And so there is variety in these stories. If you try to make them all fit together, you kind of ruin the the story. I think each and every individual Mothman witness saw something different. Like there is no one Mothman. It's kind of an archetype at this point. But each person saw something different. Some people saw red eyes. Some people didn't. The best description of his coloration that I've seen is he was described as lunar because some people said it was white and people said it was gray. And lunar is probably the, the grayest description I've ever heard because it's like the surface of the moon, you know, like it's a dusty uh, white or like a, a dirty color of gray and white. Uh, I was just watching something on, I, I think it was a, a Da Vinci painting where uh, when he was painting Mary and some other holy figures and he was intentionally looking at the moon to try and to get that lunar kind of holy type of, of coloration, I suppose, in, in the, the painting. And also the one of the um, cases that I've been most drawn to and, and compelled by is, is um, one that happened here in my home state, just about an hour from me in Fayetteville, uh, a guy named Chris Bledsoe. Uh, he's, he's been the source of a lot of study from people all over the, the world because uh, he has these uh, encounters that are sort of continuing on his property all the time, which is largely orbs and other things, but it, it includes things like his tree catching on fire. And but he's most known for for a um, uh, a sighting that happened with, with several other people while he was fishing, including his son. But it, it kind of culminated. I mean, I'm totally abbreviating it, but he, they ended up back at his house where um, he saw this little being in the woods that again was he, he described it as like the color of the moon. So, so just to, to bring up again that like see that kind of theme repeating in, in these these various places. Well, that that's definitely awesome. I, I, the story that comes from is actually from Lawrence Gray, who saw a winged creature by his bedside in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. It was actually in August 1966 at 3 p.m. Jefferson Avenue, Point Pleasant. So it was, he saw the creature um, by his bedside, and he described it as he thought it was the devil. Right? That was that was his take on it. He said. It was um, a six to seven feet tall, glowing figure with deep eyes, large wings, standing with its shoulders arched and its head tilted, lunar in coloration, a dirty and gray white color, stood in his bedroom for about 45 seconds, and it vanished when the witness thought of Bible verses. Um, I was just recently looking up moon phases, actually, and seeing if that would correspond to different sightings and things like that. If the idea was during like a full moon or a waxing moon when it's coming into being, if these things would also come into being, you know what I mean? 
lunar stuff also plays into this sort of pseudoscientific idea that um, the moon would affect people's mentality. It's where the term lunatic comes from. These 13 months, I keep going over the Mothman 13 months over and over again, trying to find new ways of looking at it. And that was when I stumbled across. So yeah, I, I think I always come back to like, um, so, so similar to dreams where like, like uh, I think that the naturalistic explanations make sense that, that, you know, memory consolidation and emotional processing is happening within dreams. But I also feel like there's this, this other kind of rich mythic strange component to dreams that also feels real and maybe more important. So, so I guess I, I sort of take a similar approach to these strange happenings where, um, probably there, there could be some naturalistic explanation, be that kind of the electromagnetic earth lights, tectonic plates, temporal lobes, and maybe, maybe moon kind of influences and other things that we can think of electromagnetic. I'm not sure. So like all those things probably are at play, but I guess I keep coming back to say yes, but, but still for me, the, the big juicy mysteries and richness is around sort of the, the myth in, in the, just the, this, this pure strangeness of the thing where it feels like the, kind of the simple naturalistic explanations just cannot fully account for all of it. Yeah, I was telling Newman about uh, the first time that I met you, that, that you came up to me and at the Mothman Festival. It's like, hey, are you Justin Brown? I'm like, whoa, dude, who is asking me that? <laughs> who the hell knows me? Out of You know, you picked me out of a crowd, which I just, you know, is the first time that's ever happened. No, one, no one's came up to me in a crowd in that situation. It was pretty cool, though. Yeah, well, you were carrying around like a, like a camera, like on like a tripod to your, like on your side. So it was kind of, kind of obvious because you're, you're very high tech with your uh, gizmos and gadgetry. Uh, do I stand out? <laughs> yeah. What three items would you have in your cryptid hunting slash tracking kit? So if you were going out <laughs> looking for monsters, what, what would you bring with you? Well, uh, I would definitely have a map um, because Everyone knows when you go out in the middle of nowhere, you can definitely lose cell signal. So you definitely need a map and a compass. <laughs> it would be a map, a compass, and probably oh, it has to be three things. Mm -hmm. I probably have. I'd probably have a firearm. I. I, I mean, I live in Southern Ohio. I. I, got, I have a, an interesting story where I. Me and uh, my tech leader on my team, Derek Schreiner, got lost in the Zaleski Forest for six hours and uh the rangers wouldn't even come in um to get us until it was daylight so we had to find our way out and he fell in a freaking uh abandoned well and almost broke his ankle and he had to walk a mile and a half down through this coal mining ghost towns just to get back but yeah i would ha i'd have a firearm a map and a compass <laughs> okay well um if you're going out in the woods looking for sasquatch or like sasquatch footprints or something i think it's good to have course a camera so you can record whatever you find but two uh, is a ruler because if you ever find a footprint and you want to take a photo of the footprint you got to make sure you have some kind of size comparison so I, I like to put down a ruler next to whatever i take a photo of um some people go with a backpack full of that like um plaster they like quick mix plaster that they can put down and actually do a plaster cast immediately because it's very rare that you'd ever find a footprint like that's actually good enough to be plaster casted so i don't know that right. i would be that prepared to bring that i know a lot of people who bring guns when they go out looking for sasquatch but they don't intend to shoot the sasquatch they're concerned about other animals or humans that's typically the concern so they bring a gun with them um so i would say i would just bring my camera and a ruler and i like to pack light you know some sort of way to know where i was going i guess like a satellite Water. phone maybe Water's um good. i know <laughs> sasquatch sightings in 2020 have kind of clustered around southern West Virginia. So I went off into the woods in Fayette County, and uh, I got briefly lost, but I was able to follow some power lines back to back to civilization. I would just bring a map. And what I do is <laughs> I, Google Earth, I Google Earth everything before I go if I'm going to be in that environment. So I am kind of have a, an ideal, you know, roads are this direction, um, campsites are this direction. There's you know, generally in the wilderness, there's, you know, campsites or paths that are marked on trees, so on and so forth. And I just think a map, dude, you, you should always have a map and a compass. Yeah, well, if you have a cell phone, then you got that covered. But, you know, if you don't, then you probably need something else. 
Um, but a lot of places I go to, I don't think I would be able to find a map because like they're kind of like off trail places. That's where I was. I was like deep in the woods, like in the middle of nowhere. I like it. You guys are, are practical. So <laughs> if I can uh, tag along with you guys, I think I would rely on your practicality and bring things that are less practical. So uh, I, I would bring things like a, a notebook so that I can immediately record my um, experiences as or immediately after they happen, just to, so I can remain truer, not not have to rely so much upon after the fact memories. Um, I would probably bring some sort of bait, be that monster bait, maybe some apples or something like that. I don't know. Um, and then finally, I would probably bring some sort of um, item, uh, maybe a book of some kind. I don't know if there's a field guide, but, but maybe more importantly, a book that feels like it has some sort of uh, uh, quality to it, attractive quality to it, where it speaks to me and feels like it might do more to serve as something like a magnet to to draw more of these types of experiences. Yeah, that, that's another thing I would uh, say to bring with you is uh, bring your belief with you or borrow someone else's, you know, go in with the mindset, you know, like positive communication, maybe bring someone with you who believes in uh, Sasquatch. I would say that's probably something to bring with you. Uh, you mentioned apples. There, There's the apple devils in West Virginia, these um, Sasquatch like creatures that steal apples from apple orchards. So that's a commonality. Mm -hmm. And what Justin mentioned and what you mentioned about apple orchards. Weird things happen in apple orchards. <laughs> um, my friend says that he brings dogs with him because he thinks that they can uh, sense the activity. And that's a common idea in the paranormal is that dogs can sense the activity. There's the idea that they can see different colors in the color spectrum. And so they are more aware. So when he goes Sasquatch hunting, he brings dogs with him. But some people think that would steer them away. Whatever you're not looking for is probably what you see. But then again, I think belief plays into it. So I don't know. Have a cert bring a certain mindset because that, that's kind of what like uh, seances and spiritual communication is. You kind of go in with a certain mindset. I did a seance recently in um, on Halloween. Uh, posted that video on my channel if you guys have seen that. The I whole added it to my watch later. I'm excited about it. Yeah, the whole opening was um, sort of trying to get people in that mindset. I've had some some weird things going on in my house uh, for 2020. The like I said, the doorknob turning, and then recently uh, when I went into the bathroom, like um, I think a week ago or so, I flipped the light on and I it was like a a white mass like shot across the the room above me, and I ducked down like instinctively ducked down, and then when I saw there was nothing there, I rose back up. Wow. So I think that it might be something to do with being you know, stuck inside for so long. Um, I've heard people say yeah. that paranormal activity is increasing for 2020 because of like the quarantine and people being stuck inside. Do you guys think that um, that kind of could play into paranormal activity or just people notice more well, there? Well, I think the more, the more that you feel traumatized in a way, like if, if you're, if you know, if things are heightened because you're stressed or you're constantly, you know, dealing with the um, the turmoil in our political uh, channels right now, or like you mentioned COVID, you feel like, you know, a deep fear of getting it and, you know, possibly getting sick to the point where you may die. I mean, that causes a lot of stress. So there's a theory in the paranormal field that, you know, people who are under stress have polar dice like phenomena occur in their home, which those, the two things you mentioned, could be related to polar guys activity so something to think about yeah plus because i was i was stuck inside and what happened was my door was turning as if to be open and it wouldn't open you know like as if someone was trying to open it so i think that's kind of like a metaphor in a way for like wanting to go outside you know what i mean mm -hmm. and then uh during the seance we had the the tripod get like kicked twice and we had some interesting conversations with a being uh who said their name was hawthorne and so that was a pretty good uh, conversation we had there with the, um, we did a Ouija board and we did Estes Method as like a sort of a trans medium thing. So how have you guys, what have you guys been doing in 2020? Um, working. I, I've, I, I know we were shut down at the place I work at here in Hillsborough for a month and a half, almost two months. And then we got, we were allowed to come back, done a lot of overtime. I know the all the stuff that I've talked to you earlier this year that I wanted to do, I, I haven't had time to do. I'm even struggling to get all the, the stuff that we recorded 
this last year to uh, be put up. It's <laughs> it's really difficult. But uh, yeah, man, I I've been working and trying to keep all this stuff that I do in the paranormal field going. It's it's very difficult. For me too, it's been a, an eventful year. Um, of course, because of everything just going on in society, but um, even just in, in my, my personal life of leaving the uh, the research company I've been with for my whole thirteen plus year career uh, a couple months ago, and sort of setting out on this really new path. Um, and uh, yeah, even even just in the past few weeks, there's been for the first time in my life and. It, it, paranormal type happenings I, I guess i'm comfortable calling them that you know i feel uh, even though i've been studying this stuff for a while it feels like it's the first time i remember encountering stuff like this and it really has felt uh kind of strange and enlivening and and uh just interesting so wetting my appetite for this whole subject even more um but with that said guys i i i am losing steam after a, a long day so I, so i think i will have to Sign okay. off now. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming to this little digital meeting there, Newman. I also saw that you posted a Google Docs with tons of questions, a lot of like thought-provoking philosophical questions. So I think at a later date, we might be able to go over those. But thank you for showing up and answering all these questions. Thank you very much. Absolutely, yeah. I'm very much looking forward to, to future discussions with you all. And, and Mothman, thank you so much for, for organizing this. This is, uh, you're, you're speaking to my heart when you're talking about both the... Uh, the, the, the mystery part and the society part, basically, the, you know, relationships and community, as well as enchantment are basically the things that I care most about. So it's just really great to see you doing this. So very thankful for it. Yep. Thank you. All right. Have good night, good. guys. Hey, Justin, can you stay on for a bit? Yeah, sure. I'm cool. What's something interesting, historical or otherwise, about your state? Uh, I'm from West Virginia. Uh, Justin is in Ohio. The interesting thing about my state, I think, is how we came into existence during the Civil War, like how we sort of split from Virginia and were born into the Union as West Virginia. And I think it's sort of interesting how that came into existence. That a lot of people don't know we exist because, you know, it's not like North and, and South Dakota or something like that, or North and South Carolina. The name isn't East Virginia and West Virginia. It's just Virginia and West Virginia. So a lot of people get confused thinking that it's the Western region of Virginia. So I think West Virginia is sort of outcast, you know, splitting off and joining the union like that is a very unique origin story. Good old Abe Lincoln signed that bill and made West Virginia a state. Nice. I think uh, for me and being in the Southern Ohio region, historically, uh, I've been interested in Native American lore and history since my uh, great grandmother was full blooded Ojibwe and my mother, you know, pretty much embraced that heritage and always uh represented it in a really cool way and i and i feel a connection with you know that heritage and the history you know with the mounds the burial and ceremonial mounds that you find in the ohio valley and the surrounding areas like west virginia pennsylvania indiana kentucky so on and so forth i think there is a lot of intrigue and a lot of significance historically and where where I live, that I mean, it's important to always look back and to find not only the significance of it, but the uh, why we should cherish and respect and pay homage to, you know, those heritages, those cultures, because not it, it not only tells us a piece of our uh, story about who we are, where we came from, but just how we protect and teach about that history and how we kind of came out of how this Southern Ohio, the colon, the colonization of it was pretty much mowing the mounds over. We were pretty much trying to eradicate the native Americans from the land. And then there was some, you know, there's a, at least a little bit of resistance to that. And we ended up, you know, saving a few of uh, the uh, earthworks that are remaining. And there's, a lot of people who did deeply care about, you know, trying to <laughs> preserve that history and that culture in this area. So I, I, I can't think of anything more important to me than that. And, and what's interesting about it is, you know, the Native Americans had a, a huge belief in this in spiritual phenomena and being and their connection 
with those with that spirituality i think it it kind of helps me understand the paranormal through that lens you know i'm I, you know i i have to take advantage of all that if i'm going to <laughs> find any significance in the whole journey that i'm on in west virginia we have uh the grave creek mound which has like adena tribe history to it and then oh, we yeah. have the the krill mound which is in like south charleston Right. Uh, Grave Creek Mound in Moundsville, West Virginia, Krill Mound in South Charleston. You have the uh, the Serpent Mound in Ohio, and that's one I think is really cool. I live 30 minutes from there, man. It's a really cool that it's you know actually a complete serpent. Like for anyone who hasn't seen that, did you uh, did you see the new findings on that? They uh, did some um, lidar um, scans of the grounds up near the neck where the snake's head is and where it's just straight going into the snake's head they found where it originally curved and coiled there so at some point um the mound was changed hmm. no i had, and I had I, not seen that yeah it's interesting mounds are an area that you know even john keel wrote about in the moth and prophecies he mentions mounds uh and a lot of the people like john keel continue that sort of study they find them to be places of uh you know, of high strangeness and places where things happen. You mentioned the Serpent Mound. There was a crop circle back in the early 2000s, right right across the road from it. Ah, awesome. I always wanted to see a crop circle or go into a crop circle. Um, I hear that it, it will mess with your watch and mess with electronics like all other paranormal things do. Crop circles are something I've been looking into. I like that their field is called uh, seriology. Because it's based off of the Roman god Ciri, who is the goddess of agriculture. So that's a, a cool field of study, I think. Crop circles. People mm -hmm. claim to like see big orbs of light that circle around and make those. And they some people say they see pillars of light coming up from them. And so I think crop circles are a, a thing that a lot of people just kind of throw into the UFO category. And there is a connection. There are like UFOs seen over them and near them. But they really are kind of a mystery, like an agricultural mystery on, on their own. Okay, so this last question is one that we really can't answer, one that we probably should save for another uh, meeting. It's, um, they basically want to know what got us into the paranormal. So I'll just quickly say the Mothman prophecies, you know, reading about the Mothman and West Virginia folklore in the library at school, John Keel and Jeff Lomsley, a book I read in high school that kind of drove me to be involved in the paranormal because it's something that's kind of absurd in a way, the myth of Sisyphus. And if you'll look at the Appalachian Mystery Society logo, it's Sisyphus. That book is all about the absurd nature of searching for meaning in the world and how we have to keep on going and imagine Sisyphus happy as we engage in a sort of futile and absurd quest. And that's something that I really resonates with me. And it's good because he's climbing a mountain. He has to forever push the rock up the mountain and we are mountaineers. But I chose that nice. logo also because it's about sort of getting through difficult stuff. And so Despite everyone, you know, having to stay at home and go through that kind of thing, uh, we can still push forward and do society meetings and things like that in a digital way. So that's another reason why that is. So that's the logo there, just to explain that. And I think that logo probably represents 2020 the best. <laughs> a thing you mentioned, though, as your origin story, you mentioned the, the orbs and stuff, which is um, like a nature spirit. Um, experience I had that... um. I wouldn't call it my origin story, but it was, it's definitely involved in the reason why I am doing what I'm doing now. Do you want me to, to touch base on it again? or I just wanted to mention something about it real quick. Is that um, something, a story that my mother tells about when I was uh, a little kid and I was asleep, like I think I was three or four years old. She says that a, a light came in, like a, a, so like a ball of lightning, like a, an orb that circled around my head and then went away. And so I found that interesting and kind of re related to the nature spirit thing that you are interested in. Because I'm interested in Jacques Vallée and a lot of the fairy lore. And so mm -hmm. that's something that's been a part of my research and a part of my study for a long time now. And so I found it interesting that, you know, you also had that connection. Because it seems like most of the people I collaborate with, like you and Eric and Alex, they all have some kind of fairy connection. When on the surface, you wouldn't expect that because, you know, you're like paranormal investigators. So. If you want to say something about that, you can. Um, yeah, I think I think it's because um, you know you spoke about the right person, the right place, right time. Mm -hmm. um, it could be the Appalachian Mountains are definitely home 
to a lot of um, different elementals. I don't think people like us want want to be filtered. I feel like we want, you know, we want our eyes to be open. And I think there's there's a point in our lives at this time where we want to, you know, dilate those eyeballs as much as possible. Our natural intrigue and interest and in those type of things is a part of it. Now, maybe we have shamanistic qualities. I know my mother and I share um, shamanic qualities and. Um, I definitely see that in Alex, and I and I cu- I could see that in, within you as well. Um, we could be, you know, kindred to them in some way we're not yet understanding fully. Maybe you can sleep on that. <laughs> Let me know. Mm-hmm. What I was gonna say about Fayette before is the connection that has to like the Fay and um, the fairies and that sort of thing. I definitely see some Mothman fairy connections there. Fay DeWitt Laporte and. Loretta Fay Campbell were both West Virginia Mothman witnesses. Also, West Virginia Mothman witness Connie Carpenter's mother, who is the sister of Mary Heyer, the reporter who reported all this stuff, was Fay Carpenter. So there was a lot of people named Fay, and I don't know how much how common that name is, especially in the '60s. But it seems like there's a lot of people with Fay as their first or middle name in the Mothman case. <laughs> You're a fan of synchronicity, I see. Yeah, synchronicity, Carl Jung. Yeah, um, I definitely p- try to pay attention to it, but not, you know, I, there's definitely something to it, and uh, I, I am very skeptical, and I, I try not to be too skeptical when it comes to what we perceive as synchronicities. But um, I, I think that the, there is some type of pattern um, and trend when it comes to these type of things that we shouldn't, you know, we should stay open-minded about. Yeah, like what what I do sometimes is if I'm working on a bunch of things and there's a synchronicity, like a a big important synchronicity in one of them, I'll kind of put that one up to the top of my list of things to do, Mm -hmm. like use it as a kind of a guide. But, you know, I know that people build narratives around themselves. And when I look at people who study synchronicities and look at names and things like that, it does kind of look like they're playing like a role playing game, like Dungeons and Dragons, but with their real life. So I kind of look at that and see. You know, we build narratives. That's what human beings do, is we, we tell narratives about ourselves and we kind of play them out in reality. But we've got to make sure that there's some truth in that, that there is reality in the narrative. And so that's something I try to maintain, is that there's truth even in a story that's mythological or that's folkloric. Yeah, we want, we want people to take us seriously. You know, um, if, if we're going to connect with some type of mainstream, you know, connect with those who... Um, will try to make you think that, you know, you are crazy or so on and so forth. I think, I think that's what's good about societies like what you're trying to put together is it makes you feel less crazy. It makes you um, feel like you're connecting with those people and you, you, you feel less stress doing the research and going about what you were talking about because you can feel alone and outcasted in a way. My my family is very superstitious, and I see a lot of connection they have to folkloric things and uh, in the Appalachian region. For example, like uh, my great aunt actually worked at as a nurse in the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. There was someone who was sentenced to Moundsville for killing one of my relatives. You know, and he was like one of the second to last people to be hanged there at the gallows. So I, I see a lot of weird connections to history and and. You try not to, you know, make that more of a thing. Well, I, I think that a lot of people who do this type of research, I think that the relationship they all share is they feel like there's some type of mysticism that surrounds their lives, and they tr- and there, there's there's these breadcrumbs that lead them into the past and then even into the future, and it's hard to ignore crumbs. So, I believe that. But you, like you said, you want to be careful <laughs> not to go down rabbit holes that your, you know, your overactive imagination creates along the way. Yeah, human beings, we we can do science and we can do math, but we don't spend our lives looking down like a microscope. We don't spend our lives being objective. You know what I mean? Like if you saw something and your memory tells you that you saw that, even though logically you know that your memory could be faulty, you still would be confident saying, "No, I know what I saw." And so there is, you know, we live a life that's subjective, 
and we know that like even our memories are faulty our perception is so flawed um but we still live that life anyway as if what we're seeing is true we accept our subjective perception and reality is true so mm-hmm. so i kind of look at it like that is what we do is we live a story we kind of act things out and i see a lot of that in the paranormal field of people telling themselves a story about themselves or acting out a story in themselves and i think everyone feels like they're on some quest some spiritual journey and that they're being communicated with through the events of their lives christians will say their whole life is a prayer or their whole life is a conversation with god it's the material and the immaterial both of these things playing out in reality and so i see that as kind of what we have to do as researchers is balance that balance the skepticism and the debunking and the sort of Fordian thing with a genuine interest in spirituality and anomalies and live our lives with the narratives that we're playing because there's no way to stop yourself from being like a storyteller or from viewing the world in a mystical sense but you also have to make sure that what you're doing is genuine and true and that you're not like you said just um you know on some wild goose chase or chasing down synchronicities and patterns that you see just because you know you're looking for some kind of purpose or meaning and so that goes back mm-hmm. to the Sisyphus thing. Some some people claim to have psychic ability, and other people are as psychic as a rock. I think that things happen all around us that we're not aware of, even though we have the faculty to be aware of them. It seems like we're not connecting with those faculties, and it is there may be something going on. There may be reasons. The most interesting part of that is what we are filtering out, you know, of those things around us. And um, it may not be, that may be the only mystery behind it, (laughs) which is crazy. There are unconscious effects on the mind and on uh, civilization, on society. These kinds of experiences, you know, play into. And Mm -hmm. I think any sociologist or historian would have to admit the immense influence that religion and spirituality plays on humanity like that's what draws the lines on the map that's what people like fight and die for is spirituality and religion and that sort of connection to something greater than themselves and if you look at some of the origins of these spiritual modes of thought these spiritual uh, ideologies and frameworks of viewing the world like UFOs, for example, or spiritualism in like the 1800s, the, you know, spiritualist movement, all these different things, a lot of the origins of them come down to like sightings and mystical experiences like the miracles in the Bible or Marian devotion popping up in a specific location because of Marian apparitions. A lot of these modes of thought and frameworks, like going down the TNT area looking for a, a winged creature, They all come from experiences that individuals have, a sighting or a miracle or a magical event. So if we can understand that our culture and a lot of our ways of thinking can come from those kinds of experiences, I think that shows the importance of them, regardless of if they are just absurd and nonsensical and didn't really happen the way that we think they did. And it's that kind of research that I think is the way we'll be able to understand what these experiences mean. The paranormal witness is Prometheus. Prometheus is the one who went to the heavens and brought fire down to mankind. The witness goes into a world beyond our understanding and brings back knowledge. And for that, they have to suffer because Prometheus was pecked apart by birds. That's what the paranormal witness is, is someone who brings knowledge to us. But the paranormal investigator has hubris. There's someone who is engaged in trying to understand this, trying to outsmart the gods in a way, trying to understand what's going on. And that's the story of Sisyphus. Sisyphus was a king, and in different stories, there's different ways in which he angered the gods. But in some way, he angered the gods to where they punished him for his hubris and said, you will forever push this rock up the mountain. And every time the rock gets to the top of the mountain, it will roll back down. And so Sisyphus is continually doing this absurd task. And I feel like that's what we do in the paranormal. We continually push the rock up the mountain, and just when we think we've got the answer, just when we think we know, the rock rolls back down. The villain pulls off its mask and reveals it's not what we thought it was. But if we keep doing that, 
the, the idea of that is we'll find meaning in that. And that's the idea behind Sisyphus, is you'll find meaning in the absurd task. And so you have to imagine the paranormal investigator happy in his absurd task. And perhaps one day in the overall, when we finally reach that moment of the final stage of human's evolution, childhood's end, as Arthur C. Clarke called it, we'll move on to that final thing when we reach that final step. And the only way would be to archive and to share and to do research that is collaborative, you know, because I'm just one person. I can't study the entirety of all monster spirits and UFOs over Appalachia. I have a pretty good understanding of folklore in West Virginia, though. So the idea is to pull that research together, put it all in one place. You take what you got, you put it in a pot, and we're making stone soup. Nice. I, uh, I, I think you view the paranormal in a unique way. I think, well, you. uh, you know, I think you have a lot to offer as far as, um, perspective. And I think that, yeah, you know, you, the, what you're trying to do is something I definitely want to help you do. So, um, I'm, I'm going to jump in as often as I can provide, you know, you with any information that I have for your, you know, database and, you know, anything like that. As far as, you know, what I've, you know, the research I've come across or, or anything like that, because I feel like that's very important. And I, I definitely want to contribute to something like that, because if there's others who are, you know, getting access to this information and it helps them push the research, then I'm, I'm definitely going to help with that. Yeah, because I'm, I'm very into um, amateur folklorists. You know, there, there are people who actually go to school and have a uh, a degree as a folklorist, but we're kind of like amateurs of that who share notes. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the idea behind this kind of research. And I think it's better than, you know, certain people who are ideologically focused on one thing. I think it's better to be an, an overall thing of overall mystery, you know, because there, there are certain people who like, if someone says they saw a Sasquatch and a UFO, they'll mark down the Sasquatch, but not the UFO, or they'll mark down the UFO, but not the Sasquatch. And so I'm kind of trying to have that intersectional high strangeness. Okay. Yeah, it's not, it sounds like you think that's all connected, mm -hmm. related. So. Well, e even if it's not, I think that it all deserves to be like documented and archived. And, um, oh, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I believe that there should be collaboration in all areas of the uncanny or alien. Now, that's one, that's one thing we didn't get into. We'll, we might have to talk about later is that a lot of this stuff comes down to people's reaction to what they consider to be monstrous or what they consider to be alien. And there's a, you know, there's a big variety about what people consider to be alien or monstrous and the way they react to it. Like someone, some people who are very open and accepting would view the alien as this great being who's going to save the world from nuclear annihilation or whatever. And then some people who are very sort of more, um, more skeptical of things that are alien or foreign, they would, um, you know, consider it to be more evil, and so that's where you get the idea of the, the scary aliens, right? So I do think it's completely psychological uh, based on people's ideas of the uncanny and the strange. I think it all deserves to be documented and documented together. Well, I've definitely been able to, to do some field research despite our situation, but it, you know, it's definitely, I've definitely had better years, but I'm still able to do some. Okay, so we're gonna end off this uh, meeting of the Appalachian Mystery Society. I'll let you have the last word, my friend Justin. Uh, I am the Mothman Historian, founder of the Appalachian Mystery Society. Signing off. Mountaineers are always free. Justin? Hey, I'm Justin Brown, founder of Lean Investigator Interface Death, and uh, keep it spooky. <laughs>